This is The Red Line, where we talk to three expert witnesses about one issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. While studying for this nation, an old Navy proverb came to mind. If you park a battleship in front of someone, they don't notice the aircraft carrier behind them. And there is fewer places in the world this is more relevant to than the nation of Guyana. A relatively small forested country of less than 800,000 citizens on the north coast of South America. Guyana is the aircraft carrier, smashed right in the middle of a number of huge continental battleships. Like the aggressive regional giant Brazil, the slowly imploding nation of Venezuela, and the old US enemy of Cuba. But yet Guyana goes almost completely unnoticed by the rest of the world. Whilst everyone else focuses on Brazil and Colombia and Venezuela, other nations have been building a presence in Guyana. A presence that could one day threaten the very balance of power for the entire Western Hemisphere. This goes beyond single elections, beyond regional politics. Now nations like Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, and even the US have their eyes on what may become one of the most important squares on the geopolitical chessboard. This week, we sit down with three experts to explain the geopolitics of Guyana, the reason every country is vying for control, as well as how private companies like Cambridge Analytica worked on behalf of governments and businesses to alter the democratic course of this nation. And rather than just have an expert come on, we do this by sitting down with the woman who is at the top of Cambridge Analytica, doing the deals that set in motion the next geopolitical flashpoint that is Guyana. But for now, we need to fully understand the geopolitics of Guyana. And for that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Slipping Through the Cracks Guyana has the dubious distinction of being the only English-speaking country in the continent of South America. A relatively small country in terms of geographic size, 8 to 3,000 square miles. And smaller even still in population terms, less than a million, uh, has the great credit of having a great resource base. Oil is now discovered as of 2015. Uh, Gold, bauxite, manganese, agriculture has been the mainstay for a good period of the history. But notwithstanding that rich resource base has had significant problems over the decades of political management, political control, significant to which has been the racial animosity between the two predominant races, people of African descent and people of Indian from native of India descent. Ivor Law Griffiths was born in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana. He was vice chancellor of the University of Guyana, president of Fort Valley University, and is now a senior associate specializing in Latin America and the Caribbean nations for the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. And he joins us today. And so Guyana is an interesting place. Uh, it's a place where you've got a mix of ethnicities reflecting that historical contour, but it's also a place that is in many respects uh, caught in a circumstance. Uh, you, you know, sometimes you get the impression it's, it's time caught in a time warp because of management issues and political control issues over the decades. And that's Guyana. So although Guyana is physically in South America, they're not like most South American nations. You know, they don't speak Spanish or Portuguese and they don't view themselves as South Americans. So how do they identify themselves? Call, it's, you know, the, the, the anomaly I used to, when I lectured at the American academies over the decades, I used to offer the officers a bet that if you were to go to uh, South America and you ask any Guyanese if he's South American, he'd say, no, he's Caribbean. And that anomaly is a function of the fact that like many of the islands, Archipelago Caribbean, Guyana has been connected by virtue of the English colonization to English language. And there's a great affinity to the island Caribbean, the English history, English colonization, than there is to South America, where there is largely, mostly Portuguese, Spanish, 
and Dutch and French. So you'll hear Guyanese referring to themselves as being Caribbean, although geographically Guyana is in South America. And they take being Caribbean very seriously, even hosting the headquarters of CARICOM, the Organization for Caribbean Nations. You know, they have much more in common with a nation like Trinidad and Tobago than they would with a nation like Venezuela. So you were talking earlier on about the demographic divide between the African and Indian populations of the country. So can you elaborate a bit on that? That racial animosity dates back to the 1950s, decades above, decades before independence was secured in 1960. There was a political party formed, two leaders of which represented those two races, one Afro-Guyanese, a gentleman called Forbes Burnham, and one Indo-Guyanese, a gentleman called Dr. Shetty Jakin. And for a good bit of the 50s, they were in unison. And then there was a political divide, the split in 1955. And so one faction of the political alliance went off to be the People's National Congress. The faction headed by Jagan, the indo guyanese remained the People's Progressive Party. And ever since then, 1955, 1953, I think it was, there has been that coalescing around race for the pursuit of political power. And that has dogged the nation ever since then. So even though there was, you know, uh, 54 years and two day and one day ago, actually, political independence in May 26, 1966, even though there was camaraderie and solidarity and euphoria at the time of political independence, the racial tensions were there below the surface and they were raised, accentuated at the wrong time of elections. And so you've had a long history of racial tensions and at times of political contestation, you would have the, the relative, relative um, at one point relatively equal forces but by virtue of emigration and by virtue of a lower population, lower birth rate among the afro guyanese the indo guyanese constitute now about 40% of the population and afro guyanese constitute about 30% of the population. You have the other formations of ethnicities, people of European descent, the native indigenous Indians uh, also being part of the mix. Uh, so, if you were to think in terms of a plurality, the indo guyanese group has the largest plurality. And by virtue of that reality, for a long time, the People's Progressive Party, which transformed itself into a People's Progressive Party civic, another alliance we created, they were assured a victory. Circumstances change where, by virtue of an emigration, significant emigration in the 80s and the 90s, that solid plurality was no longer guaranteed at times of election. And so it's been a roller coaster over the decades. And the most recent episode of political contestation, March of this year, still has not been declared who is the victory, who, you know, who has the victory by virtue of issues over the elections and so on. So that, that contestation for power has been dogged by the racial animosity of the two major races, people of African descent, people of Indian descent. So after Guyanese independence from the British, Guyana formed very close ties with the Soviet Union. Such close ties that this tiny nation of, at the time, less than 600,000 people was home to the largest Soviet embassy in all of South America. Why would the Russians have such an interest in a small nation like Guyana? In the 1970s in particular, as many parts of the developing world, then called the Third World, were evincing socialist, Third World, non-aligned kind of tendencies, there were great alliances developed with the communist world. Cuba, Russia, you know, then parts of the, of, of the communist world generally. So that explains part of the historical backdrop. But Russia also 
was interested in Ghana because the uh, United States was an enemy. You know, keep in mind that this is the period of the Cold War. So uh, a friend of my enemy is my friend. And by virtue of the fact that the Guyanese government at the time was nationalizing capitalist interests, sugar was nationalized. Sugar had been owned significantly by the British. Bauxite was nationalized, owned significantly by the Canadians. You know, that galvanized the Russians to be supportive of the Guyanese and build that alliance. But subsequent to the, to the collapse of the USSR, there has been a slight diminution of that ideological coalition, that alliance, in addition to which the party in power itself, at, at one point, at one point, the People's National Congress itself became distant, abandoned the, the socialist pursuit, and became more significantly allied with the United States. So there was a lessening of the interest by virtue of the ideological twists and turns, but Russia has always had a significant interest. But that interest also went beyond ideological and went to economic. Russia has been a significant investor in the bauxite industry. So we know the Russians have heavy investments in the country, but is Russia a majority investor or just one of many nations trying to invest in Guyana? It's, it's one of many nations invested. And if you were to ask, you know, what countries have got investments, I would say that America's invested significantly there, along with China, along with Russia, along with Britain. And if you were to take only the oil sector, significant to which has been American, but the general reference to ExxonMobil is a reference that ignores the reality that that significant oil find in 2015 May, where you hear the name ExxonMobil, it's not only been ExxonMobil. That's a consortium of ExxonMobil, which is an American company, the Hess Corporation, which is an American company, and a, a Chinese company, uh, Nexon. So the Chinese are significantly invested, not only in the oil sector, but also in the timber industry. The merchandising, as you know, the Chinese love to get into the, the merchandising business uh, there and there. But there are many other European countries in particular that have got interest in the oil sector. The British Tula is there. Respal, the Spanish company has been there for a while. CGX is a Canadian company has been there. Uh, doing its thing. Uh, so there are a number of other countries other than America and Russia that are there staking their economic interests and making, um, trying to maximize the opportunities for what is virgin territory for, and so far as oil is concerned. So there are a number of players around the world that are part of the economic landscape of Guyana. So the oil we're referring to here is the 2015 discovery of around $40 billion worth of crude oil in the waters off the Guyanese coast. This was a huge discovery, incredible for the nation of Guyana, but did further damage already tense relations with their western neighbor, Venezuela. Venezuela claims ownership of around 60% of Guyanese territory, and relations between Caracas and Georgetown are so bad there isn't even a single road that connects the two capitals together. So why are things so bad between Venezuela and Guyana? The conflict between Guyana and Venezuela dates to the colonial period of both countries. And that colonial dispute, a dispute between Venezuela and Great Britain, that dispute was resolved in 1899 with an arbitral award. An arbitral award that demarcated the territory which is now Guyana. And that award was accepted by Venezuela. Uh, Guy Britain did not get everything that it was claiming, but it got a good bit of what it was claiming. It was an arbitral award with a, a Russian judge, an American judge, matter of fact, a, chief, a former chief justice of the United States was ahead of that arbitration. The arbitration panel sat in Paris, and in 1899, all the parties agreed that this would be the territory up until 1946, when one of the attorneys working for the Venezuelan side in the dispute arbitration panel 
left the letter to be opened when he died. And so posthumously, a letter was opened and that letter claimed that the 1899 Arbitral Award was a fix. That Venezuela got the wrong side, the shitty end of the deal. And Venezuela needs to do something about it. Now, Venezuela did nothing about it until Guyana was approaching getting independence from Britain and the recognition of the significant amount of natural resources, the gold, you know, the, the timber, the manganese, all that was in that significant portion of uh, what is Guyana. It happens that that portion being claimed by Venezuela is five-eighths of Guyana's territory. They claim everything west of the Essequibo River. As a matter of fact, you were to go to a map of Venezuela, let's say at the embassy of Venezuela in any capital or in Caracas, you would see what is Guyana's Essequibo territory on a Venezuelan map as La Zona en Reclamación the territory to be retaken, to be taken back. And so that dispute has raged ever since 19, 1965, just before the independence was secured in May of 1966. And it's been ups and downs over the decades. At one time, it was frozen for 12 years in a protocol negotiated by the then Prime Minister of Trinidad, Eric Williams, it's been bouncing back and forth between the United Nations, good offices, and now it's before the International Court of Justice, which incidentally, Venezuela said it does not accept the jurisdiction of. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, March of this year, the ICJ panel should have heard the first set of arguments because Guyana formally took the matter in 20, 2013. Um, 2018 to the ICJ, uh, but the COVID pandemic caused a stay in those proceedings. So the ICJ is hopefully soon to set the new date for a hearing to start that proceeding. So that dispute for five eighths of Guyana's territory has a long history, dating back to 1899, and. Over, over the years, Venezuela has tried to make several overtures for a political deal, you know, give us a piece of territory, and we'll forget the whole deal. Uh, but Guyana has been adamant that the 1899 award is binding on all parties, and they're not going to proceed any bit of territory. So was the fighting between these two large-scale or just diplomatic? There, there were clashes of two kinds, primarily. There was uh, in 19, just before Guyana secured independence in 1966, uh, Venezuela made a little few, a little impasse. They occupied an island in the river that separates Guyana and Venezuela, the Cuyuni River. Half of that island is Guyana's, half is theirs. They occupied the whole island as a kind of test of Guyana's willingness to be able to respond militarily. Guyana being in no position to match their military strength, did a protest along with Britain and the rest of the world. They did not move. There was no effort to move them physically or militarily. But their, most of the aggressiveness over the years has been economic and diplomatic. For a good number of years in the 70s and the 80s, they made, Venezuela made significant efforts to dissuade any investors looking to exploit that part of Guyana. They made threats about the absence of any stability, given the fact that they posited their claim as being legitimate. For a num so for a number of years, there has been the, the war, so to speak, on the diplomatic front, on the economic security front. Nothing overt except periodically Ra one president, Raul Leone, sent a little flotilla. And at one point, Hugo Chavez sent a little flotilla. Uh, but there was no overt. And that is partly because it was not in the interest of any 
Western or South American nations to reopen that dispute. I mean, keep in mind that Brazil has a border with almost every South American country. And if you were to renegotiate that border there, it would affect the border of Brazil and it will create other nations in the South American continent that have got claims to reopen those claims. So Brazil tried uh, diplomatically significantly to ensure that nothing was graduated to the level of overt military action. And coming back to something I mentioned earlier, uh, during the period of the 70s and 80s, there was a socialist posture by the government of Guyana. Guyana's leadership at the time got the overt commitment of Cuba to come and help in case Brazil, in case Venezuela made any military overtures. So it was not in the interest of the United States to allow Venezuela to do something that would precipitate Cuba's intervention to support Guyana. So all the parties were acting behind the scenes to ensure that there was no military action on the part of Venezuela. Um, so it, 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 you know, it was mostly a quote-unquote war conducted by other means. So with Guyana having all of these new resources, an important geopolitical position, the key to keeping Brazil's borders the way it is, and an electorate pretty much cut down the middle, where swinging the vote by 1-2% to 2 would win you the presidency, which nations do you think would have an interest in influencing the Guyanese democracy for their own purposes? Well, you know, all, all the stakeholders that I mentioned, the uh, Amer- United States has a major interest in, in ensuring that there is, on the political landscape, sufficient stability to allow the economic opportunities to be pursued by American corporate interests. Similarly, the British, similarly, the Spanish, similarly, the Chinese. As you know, the Chinese don't get, uh, don't become preoccupied with the political and ideological. They're purely after the, the, the economic opportunities. But I would imagine that they would have self-interest only, even if only self-interest, and anxiety to see the political calm is the order of the day. Because in the absence of that political calm, their economic pursuits will be undermined and affected. Can, Canada has significant interests in the oil as well as significant interests in the gold Suriname has its own dispute issues and they're anxious, they will be anxious to see calm. Uh, Brazil, the Leviathan of the whole neighborhood, would want to see calm. And so people proximate to Guyana and far away from Guyana, China and others, would be interested in as much calm and stability, even if only for economic self-interested reasons. Guyana is now the bell of the ball, and we haven't even got to the other huge advantage it has up its sleeve. The country for decades sat in the corner, not attracting too much attention. But that was until 2015, when the oil was discovered. Everybody knew whoever won the 2015 election would inherit all of the nation's oil, and the wealth that comes with it. The government coming in would be in the position to award contracts, pick its friends, and direct the country into this new, far wealthier phase of its history. There was a lot on the line in 2015. And with the Indian Guyanese rule party, the PPP, in power since 1992, this would be the election for Guyana. With the political divides cutting the country in half, all you would need to do is swing it by 2-5%, and whoever could provide that 2-5% swing would forever earn the loyalty of the government in Georgetown. And like that, in stepped Cambridge Analytica and our next guest. Part 2. Divide and Conquer. My former CEO, Alexander Nix, used to say that with two years planning and enough funding that you can nearly guarantee an election win. Brittany Kaiser was the former business development director turned whistleblower for Cambridge Analytica. For people who may not be aware, Cambridge Analytica was the firm headed by Alexander Nix, who used psychographics and data to manipulate elections around the world, in countries like Ghana and Romania, through to being partly responsible for the victorious Brexit vote and the victory of Donald Trump in 2016. 
They swung elections all around the world, altering the national directions of many nations. One of which was the crucial 2015 election in Guyana. But up until now, it wasn't public knowledge what they did for that campaign. So this week, we sit down with Brittany Kaiser herself to go through how to buy an election, how to influence a country, and break open the details about Cambridge Analytica's work in Guyana and the rest of the Western world. She joins us today. If you follow an election's playbook in terms of strategy and preparation, uh, you can affect the behavior of voters the same in any country. Uh, of course, obviously, in uh in democratically conducted elections, where global elections monitors would say uh, that the election was free and fair, uh, then, then it's easier. If you are working in a country where politicians, political parties, high net worth individuals tend to actually intervene in elections and do not conduct them according to democratic principles, then it can obviously be harder because the, the, the normal playbook uh, is, is that you would get voters to be interested in a candidate or not interested in an opposition candidate and, and you get people to actually vote. Uh, but there, there are obviously quite a few places around the world that do not run elections that way and where dirty tricks are the main playbook. So who would hire someone like Cambridge Analytica? Is it just nation states and governments or could it just be you know, a businessman looking to curry favor with a particular government? It's all of the above. It, the, the most common is that you try to engage with a political party directly, uh, but a lot of times there are high net worth individuals, uh, so business people, that will decide they support a particular candidate and they will hire an elections firm or a strategic communications firm uh, or so, someone else with these types of skills in order to support a candidate externally from the official campaign. Of course, if there is somebody that is already in government and they would like to stay there, then sometimes uh, government budgets end up getting used for these types of activities as well. I mean, you can see that right now uh, with the Trump administration. They're trying to take up as much of the airwaves as possible, uh, which is uh, obviously a campaign tactic, but the, the money and strategy and staffing is coming from official government budgets at the moment. So in your work and in your book, you speak very often about PSYOPs. Uh, can you explain what PSYOPs are? PSYOPs stands for psychological operations. It's a military term that means that you conduct a strategy to use communications to affect hearts and minds. So psychological operations used by militaries and governments is a way of understanding the way that people think and therefore being able to affect their behavior through uh, communications usually, but also field operations are involved in distributing those communications to the people. So a lot of this work comes from data gathered both illegally and legally from people. So what sort of data did Cambridge Analytica collect on unsuspecting people? When you are looking to understand as much as possible about somebody, and that's really what data collection is all about, you are trying to get a hold of every piece of information you possibly can. So these days, obviously, people walk around with spyware in their pockets. Some people call it smartphones, but... Uh, I don't think there's anything smart about it for the person that's carrying it. It's just smart for all of the companies that have installed their spyware on that device and therefore can track everything that you do from your live location to what data you're producing in apps, who you're talking to, all of your contacts, your photos, your videos, what you're searching for, what you're writing. All of this data is possible to be collected. And then outside of your own device, all of your credit card swipes, where you go on vacation, what you do with your family, uh, how, you, how often you vote. Uh, this is all data that can be collected and bought and sold and traded to tons of different companies around the world. And by tons, I mean, you know, tens of thousands of companies do this as their main uh, breadwinning. Their business is to collect and, and sell and trade your data in order to give people insights 
about you. And that could be as benign as a company just trying to sell you a new brand of toothpaste, or it could be quite a lot darker than that when it starts to get political. And what can we learn from that kind of data? If you start to look at um, people's behavioral data, you can start to understand, for instance, uh, how uh, staunch they are in their beliefs. So uh, brand advertisers call this, you know, you're either brand loyal or you're a switcher, uh, which means that you uh, could be persuaded to try something new because you're not always going to purchase the exact same thing. In politics, uh, you can tell if somebody is a strong supporter of a certain party or candidate or uh, very staunch on a certain issue, or can they be persuaded to change their mind on that candidate or that issue? And that's the most important thing that, uh, it, that you use data for, figure out people's weightability. It's different in every place, but, but normally you can find at least 20 to 30 percent of the population that can be persuaded to do something than they did in the last election or in their last purchase. And you spend the majority of your budget on these people because it's going to take too much money and too much time to convince somebody that is very um, stalwart in their beliefs to, to change their mind. But if somebody hasn't made up their mind yet or isn't you know, very far to the left or very far to the right or brand loyal, then you can spend your money, uh, a smaller amount of your money at least, talking to them about why someone else better or why the opposition brand or candidate um, isn't for them. And you'll be a lot more successful in your impact or have, uh, you know, it, it sounds kind of dark putting it this way, but you'll have a, a higher... ROI, a return on your investment for your political ad spend. So before we get into Guyana, I want to talk about a very famous Cambridge Analytical campaign in its neighbour, Trinidad and Tobago. It has a very similar cultural history, and Cambridge Analytical was hired in 2010 to flip the general election in favour of the Indian-dominated party. Cambridge Analytica was highly successful, and it brought the Indian-dominated party into power with its Do So campaign. Can you take us through Cambridge Analytica's work in 2010? Uh, the, the SCL group or, you know, Cambridge Analytica went into Trinidad and Tobago to work for um, the local Indian party. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago ha have two um, main cultural groups uh, in the country, and, and one is uh, of Indian heritage, one is of African heritage. And they, they have their own political parties, their, their own traditions, and their own cultures uh, within the country. And working for the Indian party, they did a national survey in order to further understand uh, the behaviors, attitudes, interests, levers of persuasion of the, the different cultural groups and therefore also um, the political parties within the country uh, in order to develop a strategy. So that that's the way that at least the company that I used to work for operates. And it's the way that many political strategists around the world operate. You first collect data, you first do research and polling. Even you know companies do this, they do market research first, and then you develop a strategy on, on how to engage with people. So what they found out in their research was that um, in the uh, Indian culture on the island that they uh, were very attached to the way that um, their their parents did things. So you, you you believe in what your elders tell you. You follow along family lines, and um, the 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 group from uh, that is of African heritage. Uh, they were more independent, uh, especially the youth, and tended to go out and, and do their own thing and not have those familial ties um, and, and affiliations. So, unfortunately. What this told uh, the political strategists that were working there at the time was that if you were to, for instance, begin a youth movement, that you could convince all of uh, the youth from African origin to go and make their own choice and do their own thing separate from their parents, whereas uh, the, the youth from Indian origin would do what their parents told them to do. So what they decided to do was create a youth movement that was all about rebelling against authority and saying that politics is corrupt, the government is corrupt, so we want to disengage 
because they don't represent us, they don't represent our interests. The campaign was called Do So, uh, D-O-S-O, and what that means is don't do it. So there was this huge youth movement with song, dance, demonstrations, graffiti, events, rallies, uh, basically a, a voice for the youth saying, we are rebelling against the corrupt government. We don't want to be involved in your corrupt politics. But what that actually did in practice was make all of the youth um, from one party completely disengage and decide not to vote, and the youth that were voting for the Indian party went with their parents to the polling uh, to the polling booths and they voted, which won the election um, a few percentage points, which is all you needed to win um, in, in that country at that time. So, uh, it, what, what that actually means is that it was a voter suppression campaign disguised as a youth movement, disguised as a movement for a social change to rebel against a corrupt government, but really it was just making the youth of a certain party not cast their votes in the election. And that's why these strategies are so complex, they're so dark, and they're so murky. It's very difficult to track and trace what's being done and why, where the money's coming from, and what the actual intention of some of these, uh, you know, kind of wider revolutions or movements or protests uh, actually are intended to do. And how long did it take to put a campaign like this together? Um, I, I believe in Trinidad and Tobago, it was at least nine months um, altogether. Uh, but uh, they started engaging a couple of years ahead of the time. I mean, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, if you can plan two years out, then you can nearly guarantee a win um, with the right amount of money funneled into the budget. But if you, if you plan six to nine months ahead of time, you can still have a very serious impact. If you plan a year ahead of time, you're going to have a very measurable impact. Uh, and, you know, the, the more time and the more money you give yourself, uh, the more results you'll see. And I'm curious, how much would a campaign like this cost to run? What would you have to pay Cambridge Analytica for this? I mean, it, it's usually a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, to do the research and to produce uh, the results and the strategy. That seems like a really low amount of money. That's well within the capabilities of a lot of businessmen and most nation states. So someone like Russia or China chucking in even 10 times that to buy an election, and therefore the loyalty of the government, seems like a really decent return on investment to me. Oh, absolutely. And, and trust me, th this is something that happened very often while I was at that company. It's one of, one of the... Uh, the red flags in my series of red flags that I had um, while, while working for people there, which is that uh, in, in certain countries there would be uh, business people that would pay for the campaign. And if that, uh, if that individual gets into government, um, then those, uh, that particular business of the individual that paid for it would expect to get government contracts. Uh, you know, that, that happens all over the world, um, not just in third world countries. I mean, that, that was, you know, that's common practice in, in America and the UK and all, all over the place. You know, campaign donors expect to get uh, favorable policies once the candidate uh, gets into government, regardless of what the laws look like around that. And is the money paid to you directly by a government or is it funneled through shell corporations to cover their tracks? Uh, it, it kind of depends. Um, from my experience, I saw a wide range of strategies to do that. But I, I definitely would say that due to um, election laws in a lot of countries, if an individual wanted to pay a large sum to support a candidate, uh, you would normally have to go through different types of uh, legal structures in order to hide where it had actually come from or to disperse that money out into smaller payments. Uh, you know, that, that's, definitely, that's definitely something that I saw in multiple countries. So when you guys are trying to get a movement or campaign off the ground, it's widely known that bots are used to inflate the numbers on social media, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So in the early stages of these campaigns, what percentage of traffic is actually just bot farms? Well, uh, you know, the, these days there are hundreds of companies around the world that specialize in this. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't just have to come from, um, you know, Kremlin-backed Russian hacker groups. 
<laughs> there are hundreds of companies and countries all over the world that specialize in creating mass amounts of fake accounts, um, you know, bots, troll farms that uh, artificially boost content that is convenient uh, for whoever that group is trying to support. Um, so, you know, at least half of the traffic that you receive digitally is fake anyway, and it comes from organizations or technology platforms like that that are specifically made to mimic, you know, an angry crowd of people. And that's where a lot of, you know, negative, negative content and inflammatory commentary on posts uh, and a lot of fake news is actually generated by artificial intelligence and pushed out online. So it's very difficult if you're not very digitally literate these days, if you're not media literate, uh, to not be able to spot artificially created fake news and disinformation, or even if the content itself is created by humans, it's pushed out by, bo by bots and algorithms that are made to either incite violence or make people be about a certain issue. And unfortunately, uh, the way that um, our news feeds are on social media, the way that search uh, engines work these days, it pushes up inflammatory content and the angrier people sound, uh, the more likely it is to go viral. So are these bot farms difficult to hire or is it something accessible to just anyone with money? Uh, well, you know, if, if you have a candidate that, uh, that strikes the right chord with some of these groups, um, they'll, they'll do it for free <laughs> because they want your candidate to get in because they support uh, the goals uh, of these particular hacker groups or people who have built these platforms. And, you know, that's, that's what happened in the case of, you know, Donald Trump for president. Donald Trump served uh, the, the purposes of making the U.S. and the Western world weaker. Uh, same with uh, the Brexiteers and the Brexit campaign. And therefore, money was coming out of um, plenty of foreign funders uh, unsolicited in order to support uh, the Brexit referendum happening and in order to support Donald Trump becoming president. It, it allowed these foreign powers to make the West weaker because these were campaigns that would destabilize uh, these countries. And so, you know, you, you don't always have to hire these people um, if, you, if, you have, uh, <laughs> if you have, I suppose, causes that, that are aligned. Are there any particular nations that regularly use services like Cambridge Analytica for fake news or help spread disinformation campaigns in the West? Well, I would say that the majority of the funding for um, fake news and disinformation these days is, is coming out of uh, Russia, China and Iran. And y you can see that uh, with, you know, uh, Western policies with these countries that, you know, there are not very good diplomatic relations. And you could understand why groups in those countries would uh, would be seeking to, to do harm to countries that seek to do them harm. So getting back to Guyana now, it's alleged Cambridge Analytica was hired in 2015 to swing the election. Can you take us through their work in the country? Right. So uh, in, in 2013, um, the SCL group or Cambridge Analytica uh, first started uh, having discussions with President Ramatar. And while, uh, while engaging um, with the uh, People's Progressive Party, the PPP, um, who the president was a part of that party, they conducted uh, the, the type of political research that I talked to you about earlier. They did a um, behavioral poll and what, uh, what they call a target audience analysis, a DAA, and that is uh, large-scale national research where they would have done those, um, those qualitative uh, focus groups and then quantitative surveys in order to understand as much as possible about the population from their politics to their culture to their affiliations, uh, the way that they, they do their decision making and um, the way that really the country functions, the, the way that citizens engage in society. And that allowed them to build out a, um, uh, an entire election strategy based on what they found out from that research. And from here, it, it looks like uh, it looks like in, in 2014 was when they first presented the whole strategy, and it was a, a, a full strategy for 2015 um, from what types of um, 
engagement uh, the party would would need to have with people um, from campaign management, you know, how you could continue to gain insights from the population, what you needed to put on your billboards and print media and radio and television and digital. Uh, so they, they handed over all of that intelligence um, to, to the PPP so that they could use that for all of their communication strategy. And uh, they, they developed um, a, a team for in-country and, um, and external support. So the SCL group would usually send out a, a satellite team to the country that would work with the candidate and, um, and the, uh, the team that, that was in Guyana. And then there would be support from headquarters in London for everything from data, connection, uh, data collection and analysis to, um, to management and digital and TV and development of campaign content, um, you know, strategic hiring, whatever needed to happen. Uh, and that, that's really the way that, that they ran um, quite a lot of campaigns, you know, providing limited in-person support. And then the, the rest of it would have been done from abroad, which, uh, you know, not all countries actually allow uh, political support from abroad or even political support from foreigners. So uh, it's, um, it, it's usually a satellite team that can be hidden in country and uh, is not... Uh, is not obvious to the opposition that uh, foreign assistance is is active. And how much money did the PPP spend on this? Uh, th- this particular, yeah, this particular campaign was four hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars for the support specifically that Cambridge would have given, and they would have spent a lot more than that on uh, their local team and on uh, the actual ad spend. So this is just the money to get get the Cambridge Analytica support, um, but that's not how much money they're spending on, you know, TV, digital, billboards, rallies, fundraising events, all of that stuff. You know, that's this is a drop in the ocean to what the full campaign budget looks like. The PPP hired Cambridge Analytica quite late in the election and didn't implement all of the directives coming out from London. So the PPP went on to lose to the African-dominated party, the APNU. So I want to know, why do you think the PPP weren't successful in their election in 2015? Well, I mean, there, there's, a, uh, there's a variety of reasons for, for an election loss. One is that you don't prepare ahead of time. Um, another is that you haven't spent enough money. Uh, and the other is that you do not have a good enough candidate. And I would really say, you know, there can be a combination of, of all of the above. From what I can see in the documents uh, that I'm looking at, uh, it, it seemed like the, the PPP was going to have a really hard time in that re- election, regardless of whether they had support or not, um, that they were having trouble engaging with their base. And a lot of people were completely unconvinced by um, President Ramatar's um, effectiveness in office. So for someone sitting at home right now, is there a way of identifying the tricks these companies might be using in your elections? Is there something we can keep an eye out for? (laughs) Well, um, I would say uh, these days it is is kind of difficult to tell because it, it used to be easier when there was a lot more work on the ground and you could actually see, you know, foreign people in a country doing political work. Uh, that, that's obviously the, the biggest telltale sign. But these days, so much work is done digitally and there is so much micro-targeting, uh, which means that you are shown content that is made just for you or just for a very small group of people like you uh, that, you know, the person next to you is not going to see the same political ads as you do. And therefore, you're not, it's not going to be very obvious to you that there's tons of different uh, political ads being cut, that there's uh, an entire strategy behind it, because you can only see what is meant to be engaging for you. And it's this kind of invisibility, this lack of transparency that is the most dangerous in um, what uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Emma Bryant, calls the influence industry. And it usually has tons of funding being plowed into it but you can't tell that it's happening, and that's why it is so effective. So Cambridge Analytica collapsed due to public outrage. 
but I'm assuming a lot of the infrastructure and data strategies are still available somewhere. Is there another Cambridge Analytica out there working right now? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, now there's not one Cambridge Analytica, there's hundreds of Cambridge Analyticas. Even the people that I used to work with, they're either running Trump 2020 or they have a new uh, political consultancy that is still doing work in in you know countries uh, around the world. So a lot of the people I used to work with are still up to their, their same tricks. And a lot of people um, all over the place saw how successful the Cambridge Analytica strategies were and therefore have developed their own companies that uh, it was an Oxford University report that came out I think in October of last year that called them propaganda as a service companies and showed uh, you know, the, the countries that are hotspots for the development of these types of firms. And you know, they, they specialize in technologies that are even darker and more advanced than some of the stuff that Cambridge Analytica was doing. You know, the, the troll and bot farms and you know, fake accounts on social media in order to manipulate people. Uh, that, that's something that is much worse than it was in 2016. Unfortunately, Cambridge Analytica just opened the door, uh, the Pandora's box, I guess I could say, uh, for this to become a thriving industry. With what you're telling me, can there ever be real democracy with this? Or will campaigns continue to skew toward the highest bidder who can afford services like this? I definitely think that today, uh, democracy is sold to the highest bidder. And without a global regulatory infrastructure for these platforms. We're going to continue to see uh, violence and division in society that is driven by and regulated digital space. Our, our physical spaces are very well legislated and regulated, but some of the things that you would go to jail for in person, if you do them on a digital platform, nothing happens. And, and that's where our, our biggest troubles lie. Why would so many countries be working so hard to influence and control this small South American nation with less than a million residents? It's not just the oil. It's not even just minerals. It's the country's geopolitical position and its ability to hide things that others can't. And to explain more about that, we turn to our next guest. Part 3. The Forest in the Trees. If you look at the whole region, the um, Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, they are just really odd in South America, with Guyana being an English-speaking country, the only English-speaking country in, in, in South America, Suriname being a Dutch-speaking country in South America, and then you have French Guyana, which is um, technically a part of France. Um, it's because it's an overseas department. It's a, it's, it's a real part, um, integral part of France, that's how it's considered. So that gives it a, a different set of problems that they have a lot of refugees in French Guyana, because once you enter French Guyana, you're technically in the EU. Um, a flight from Cayenne to, to Paris is considered a domestic flight. So um, if you look at the whole region, the whole region is kind of um, odd if, if for, for most people that um, look at South America, it's not something you expect in South America. Michael Unbahawan is the founder and president of Akamar Analysis Consulting, an independent US-based strategic think tank. During Michael's time with the US Army, he was the lead planner for the entire European Air and Missile Defense Theater, as well as a commander of the US Strategic Missile Defense in Israel. He works closely with developing strategy and policy for US Strategic Command, and is an expert on NATO missile defense and forward planning. His views on this program are his own and do not represent the views of the United States Army or United States Armed Forces. He joins us today. Now, when you say um, the, the, the connection with Brazil, um, that's also very interesting because there has been a shift. Um, of course, culturally, it's still the same. Guyana is always more orientated towards the Caribbean. But um, Brazil has, in the last couple of years, played a much more dominant role in, in Guyana than it has before. Um, the reason is that um, Guyana is also of some strategic importance for Brazil. Uh, if you look at the map, um, Brazil has a lot of resources um, in the Amazon region, but it takes them a long time to actually get um, to, a, to a, a seaport in the Amazon. 
Um, whereas if you, you could cut that time considerably if you could build a road going from the Amazon region um, through Guyana to the Atlantic Ocean. And that's exactly what happened. Um, this project has been going on for a while, as a matter of fact. It, it started in the 70s. and um, But they have this road now from Brazil to Guyana, which is also of importance for, for China potentially, for um, getting resources out of Brazil, getting it to port in Guyana, and then going through the Panama Canal. That, that um, saves a lot of time. One thing you first notice when you're looking at a map of Guyana is the fact that there are no roads leading to its immense neighbor, Venezuela. I understand they have a territorial dispute, but why has Guyana made that decision to sever all connections with Venezuela? Yes, that's a very good question, a very good observation too. Um, I mean, first of all, it's kind of hard to build roads in Guyana. So there's always been some limitation of how much um, connections and traffic you could have um, based upon the geography of, of, of the country. However, Venezuela especially, there are problems in Venezuela, historical problems, um, Cause, because Venezuela is actually claiming around two-thirds of Guyanese territory as its own. So it's probably in the interest of Guyana not to have too many roads to Venezuela because that would enable them to actually come over to Guyana in theory and, 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 and take the territory that they're claiming. But um, there's also been a, based upon the size of Guyana, Guyana's been considered as not too important internationally speaking, so it has, has been overlooked for a long time. And, and that causes a lot of problems nowadays because it gave a lot of people the impression that they could get away with anything they do in the country, and I'm speaking about politicians, but it's also something that has been neglected for the longest time from, from the US or from, from the Europeans and, and many other nations, and that gave other people um, grounds to actually get involved in Guyana. So recently, China has been investing lots of money into Guyana. But what is Beijing hoping to gain here? Well, if you look at China's um, actions in the, in the region as a whole, you could see that China really is trying to um, get a foothold in the Caribbean and also in South America. So it's just a, um, it's natural that, that the China will look towards Guyana. Um, and it is a, a country where they could easily gain influence. And I kind of alluded to it earlier, but Guyana was overlooked by, by a lot of other countries that could potentially could have had some role in Guyana. So it kind of created a vacuum and, and China was, was very good in, in actually stepping in and providing services um, for Guyana at a time when Guyana actually was economically speaking, not too well off. It, it was really tempting for Guyana to, to accept um, Chinese help. And um, so China has done a lot of infrastructure projects in Guyana um, and has a relatively big embassy there where they actually have exchange programs and, and try to, you know, influence uh, Guyana in a, uh, in a way that shows that China is there to help them and so forth. But um, I also said that there are also like economic interests of China and even before um, oil was discovered in, in Guyana, China saw a um, strategic value in Guyana um, for resources out of South America that could be potentially shipped out of Guyana and therefore um, save time and effort and um, have a, a closer um, it's in closer proximity to the Panama Canal, which is also uh, an area where we see a lot of Chinese um, influence, or at least, you know, China trying to get some influence on. Because the region itself, I mean, China has seen the value of the region, whereas other people probably haven't seen the value of the region, at least not at the same time as China saw it. Russia has always been a huge part of Guyana, with companies like Rusal being very large investors in the nation. So what I want to know is, what are the Russians hoping to gain from Guyana? The Soviet and Russian influence of Guyana is something that came via Cuba. Um, but Russia nowadays also sees, um, of course, the strategic importance of Guyana. And Russia, just like China, is also discovering the region as um, lucrative and, and um, as of, uh, like I said, geostrategical importance. So therefore, Russia has some sort of um, history in Guyana. Not as much as, 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 as Cuba or China, but um, the Russians have been there. And, and Russia now 
course, is more involved in Venezuela, which uh, could potentially, well, at least it could look like there is some sort of conflict because Guyana and Venezuela are officially not getting along too well. And so Russia is kind of on the Venezuelan side. But uh, I would also be careful with that because um, in the past, Guyana and Russia and, and, and Venezuela, sorry, have also had times when they actually cooperated quite um, quite well with each other. When it comes to connections in Russia, Guyana punches well above its own weight. With visits from Kremlin insiders like Oleg Deripaska, Wagner head Yevgeny Prigozhin, and even semi-regular visits from Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Is there a reason Guyana is taken so seriously by Moscow? No, I think there's more to read into that, of course. Um, I think um, if you look at Russia's involvement in the region, of course, Venezuela is um, the, the, the main involvement, the main country where we see Russian involvement. But also overlooked by a lot of people is Russian involvement in Suriname, um, Guyana's neighbor um, to the east. Um, Suriname actually has a lot of heavy Russian involvement and Chinese involvement too. Um, the, the current president of Suriname is um, actually um, not just accused, but actually convicted of, 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 of murder and um, is involved or has been involved with um, drug trafficking. His son is in a U.S. jail right now, um, also involved with drug trafficking, but also um, trying to sell training camps to Hezbollah in Suriname. And he just happened to talk to a undercover agent, a U.S. agent, but he was under the impression he was talking to a Hezbollah representative and offering um, training camps to Hezbollah in Suriname. Um, and this while he was um, the head of the anti-terrorism um, unit in Suriname. But um, so Suriname has been a country where we've seen a lot of these international players, including Russia, being heavily involved. And so Guyana being between Suriname and Venezuela, I don't I, I think it's just natural that um, they are also looking at Guyana, where they could also um, get um, influence. And like I said, I think the main problem stems from the international community just overlooking this region and it just creates a vacuum. At the time of recording, Guyana still has not announced a winner for its 2020 election. And for months, the results have now been in dispute. The US is threatening sanctions on Guyana if they do not solve this properly, and these sanctions will likely cripple the nation financially. So Georgetown is starting to look elsewhere for more dependable support. Moscow is frequently in talks with Georgetown at the moment, but what do you think Moscow would ask for in exchange for heavy support? There have been threats from the US to actually sanction um, Guyana if, if the current government is um, believed to not be transparent and, and if the vote, the election is, is believed to not have been fair, there is a potential outcome that um, there will be sanctions on Guyana or, or at least on particular persons in Guyana. Now, um, the oil has been a curse for Guyana. It may save Guyana actually when it comes to sanctions because I do believe there's a lot of interest on the US uh, with um, Exxon being the, the main um, company that, that is um, actually um, involved with the, with the oil in Guyana to continue to have oil out of Guyana. So there may be some reservations in sanctioning all of Guyana. There may be just some, some um, particular persons that will be sanctioned. But that remains to be seen. Well, if we actually do see that Guyana as a country is going to undergo sanctions comparable to Venezuela um, from the West, from the US, from the European nations, and from Canada, um, then there is a potential that, I believe, there's a potential that Guyana will turn towards um, the powers that will not sanction it, and that's namely Russia and China, and then we could see some kind of cozying up more towards those countries. Now, with that being said, on the big geostrategic, geostrategic um, chessboard, um, we have to look at what's going on worldwide and see what kind of effect it could have for Guyana and the involvement of those, those countries, in particular Russia. So Russia feels right now with um, the U.S., not um, while stepping out of the INF treaty, 
Now, Russia as well as the U.S. are heavily into the de development of, of missiles that were not allowed during the INF Treaty for, for both countries. Um, with that being said, um, Russia feels that the U.S. is potentially threatening Russia by stationing missiles of those ranges in, in countries close to Russia as a um, somewhat, because Putin actually has said, Putin has announced that they, Russia will mirror exactly what the U.S. is doing and they will mirror that as well. So if, if Russia feels that, let's say we see the um, ballistic missiles being stationed in Eastern Europe, then Russia would probably try to do the same and get the same effect towards the U.S. as, as NATO or the U.S. has towards Russia. And then the countries that would be within range for this, for these missiles, would be Venezuela, Guyana, and, and, and Suriname, for example. Maybe also Nicaragua, where they're also um, very active. And if that happens, um, the U.S. would not necessarily be prepared. And, and we already have voices in Russia that called for stationing missiles in Venezuela um, for the simple effect of putting pressure on the U.S. And um, it's, it's something that is conceived um, similar to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the Cuban Missile Crisis in Russia is perceived differently than it's perceived in the West. In the West, our main idea of the Cuban Missile Crisis is that um, this is something where the Kennedy administration just um, stayed very strong and therefore was able for the Russians to, 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 to pressure the Russians to withdraw their, their missiles from Cuba. And um, we all, of course, got very close to the Third World War, but, you know, um, we were saved and the Americans actually got what they wanted. In Russia, it's, it's seen a little differently. See, Russia actually put the, their missiles into Cuba as a reaction of, of American missiles in, in Turkey. And one of the deals of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is it's known, but a lot of people in America really don't pay too much attention to, is that when the Russians withdrew their missiles from Cuba, the Americans also withdrew their missiles from Turkey. So in Russia, um, this whole maneuver of sending missiles to, to Cuba was actually successful in that it achieved the Americans to withdraw their missiles from, from Turkey. So that, that kind of dynamic is something you see in Russia right now, that the Russians are proposing to do the same thing. And Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname would probably be um, countries that would, if, if it ever came to this, if, if, if Guyana would actually open up to Russia, then these countries would probably be something for the Russians to consider to put that sort of pressure on the United States. With missiles deployed into Guyana, that would become a huge threat to US interests in the Gulf, directly threatening crucial cities and ports like Miami, New Orleans, Jacksonville, or Corpus Christi. Is the US preparing for a possible threat on its southern flank? Uh, absolutely, but uh, you don't need hypersonic missiles. I mean, you could have, I mean, because everybody's speaking of hypersonic missiles, um, you could have medium-range ballistic missiles, I mean, traditional medium-range ballistic missiles in these areas. You could have cruise missiles, um, long-range cruise missiles in, in these areas that would achieve the same effect for the United States. Um, one thing that I also want to point out is that I said it earlier that Hezbollah was, um, you know, potentially, I mean, Hezbollah has activity in Guyana, in Suriname, of course, and to a large extent in Venezuela, we know that. Um, but if we had some of those players, if we had Iran or Hezbollah being active there and actually starting some sort of a missile program, um, I think we actually see some sort of um, precedent for that. Not in South America, but um, as we all recall in September of 2019, there was a cruise missile attack on Saudi Arabian oil facilities, which largely points to Iran. Iran, of course, to this day denies that they, it was them, it was the Houthis, they say. But um, a lot of um, evidence points that Iran at least had something to do with it. And um, I think this shows two potential scenarios. First of all, plausible deniability, which Iran is really good at. 
Um, so you could have somebody launch something out of the jungles of the northern uh, coast of, of, of South America. Um, and another thing with um, the southern U.S. and the Gulf Coast, there's a lot of oil facilities there, U.S. oil facilities, and the majority of oil refineries are, uh, are there as well for the U.S. So it's a potential target which for a um, t player which is... Um, like Iran or Hezbollah would be very um, a, a very juicy target, I believe, and um, so I, I think for those players as well, this is something to look into. And um, Iran is is very active in Venezuela. They have a, a airline, Mahan Air Airways, which flies directly between Iran and Venezuela, which is a, a private airline owned by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards and which is suspected of carrying personnel and weapons to Venezuela. I don't believe it would be too hard to actually have missile parts going in that region as well. And um, Iran definitely has the know-how to, um, to actually start a missile program in that area. So I do believe there are a lot of different scenarios that could potentially become dangerous for the United States coming out of this region of the world. If you're going to hide missiles though, why Guyana? Why not somewhere like Cuba? Well, um, well, of course there's the history of Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis, but Cuba is, is really close to the United States. Guyana is um, geographically further away. Um, and I also believe that Guyana is just easier to hide things, definitely, because, I mean, Cuba is quite densely populated. Guyana is not. And you, you said it earlier. I mean, there's less than a million people in a territory which is probably similar in size to Germany um, with less than a million people, all of them crowded at the coastline. You have the whole interior of Guyana is basically uninhabited. Um, so you have a vast... Um, um, you have a lot of land there that you could use, jungles, which could hide whatever you're doing. And um, it all comes down to what I keep saying. I think it's just that people are not re really paying attention to this region. I mean, it, it gives you a lot of um, leeway to do things. The U.S. has missile defenses and radars pointed towards Asia, Russia, and the Middle East. But does it have any protection from attacks coming from the South? First of all, yeah, the, uh, the U.S. has missile defenses for intercontinental ballistic missiles just against Korea right now and potentially Iran, if Iran has some. We really don't have any um, defenses against Chinese or Russian missiles. Um, we just don't have the numbers of interceptors and the, the, the technical capabilities are not where we could really defend against a China or Russia. However, of course, we, we, we could retaliate. So that's um, that's the one thing. But I think you still are uh, bringing up a very good point. All of our defenses and our early warning systems are looking towards China and Asia or Russia and the, uh, the North Pole because during the Cold War, um, we believe that a Russian missile attack is going to come over the North Pole. So America is pretty much blind when it comes towards any threats from the South. I really don't have anything um, that is looking towards the South um, in regard of, of, of missile defense. So yes, um, that's another reason why a uh, strategic move from one of these big players in that region would be something that um, they may consider doing. We began this piece calling Guyana the aircraft carrier amongst the battleships. And now when we focus on one area, we tend to ignore the other. And now you see why. Guyana is a perfect launchpad for weapons to be wielded against the US, by Russia, by China, or Venezuela, or even Iran. As Brittany showed us, anybody with even slightly deep pockets can buy the loyalty of a government a government that will allow you to set up missile launches in your incredibly dense jungles. The jungles of Guyana are home to large swathes of jungle not seen by any human, with engulfing treetop canopies in the south that block out not only the sun, but also unwelcome eyes. 
You can travel less than three hours from the capital, and it will be almost impossible to find anything you have hidden out there. Something pretty hard to do these days. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we got lucky, with YouTube photos of missiles out in the open in the hills of Cuba. But in Guyana, I don't think we'd ever be that lucky. The US is stepping back and threatening sanctions in the region, a move that is likely to force a treacherous decision upon Georgetown. Starve or seek help from America's enemies that see the potential chink in the US armor that is Guyana. If Iran or any other actor was to sneak missiles into Guyana, they wouldn't even need to launch them, just threaten them. Threaten the US Gulf oil rigs. With even just one of those being hit, it would cause catastrophe across the entire US Gulf Coast, all whilst providing complete deniability. After all, it's just a random missile flying out of the jungle. It would be almost impossible to be 100% sure you're blaming the right country. And I think America's enemies all know that. Unlike Iraq, the US really doesn't have an option of invasion either. It can't go search the weapons due to a lack of roads, a lack of friendly neighbors, and a lack of infrastructure that would make finding the missiles difficult, an invasion near impossible. The jungles of Vietnam would feel like an open road compared to the density of the jungles in southern Guyana. Other nations know this, and they're all doing the math right now. A small investment in a nation like Guyana or Suriname, just enough to buy an election, will give you the rights to a platform capable of threatening the world's superpower and holding the Gulf hostage. A powerful bargaining ship to trade, or a powerful way to level the playing field. All for the cost of one election. Thank you so much for listening to the program. We are well on our way to breaking our largest month of listens again this month. And this is all thanks to you guys sharing, liking, and supporting the show. A special thanks goes out to our Patreons, without whom we couldn't keep the show running. If you want to join our Patreon membership for as little as $5 a month to gain access to transcripts of the shows, live Q&As, input on episode topics, book recommendations, and much, much more, simply visit our website, www.theredlinepodcast.com. You also get to know that your donation helps the show stay self-managed and ad-free, and we put every dollar we make back into the show. It's the main reason the program continues to grow in size every month. If you want to support the show in other ways, you can like or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter on at the Red Line Pod, or follow myself on Twitter on at Mike Hilliard Oz, and Oz is like Australia. Another thanks goes out to this week's amazing guests. This week's panel was absolutely stunning, and I'm thrilled to be part of it. I've Lord Griffiths is the authority on Guyana and South America. Having him on the program was amazing, and you can follow him on Twitter at I've Lord Griffith or pick up a copy of his book, The Challenge Sovereignty, out very soon. Brittany Kaiser was an incredibly high-profile guest to have on the program, and we were thrilled to have her on. We also know she'll be back on the program in a few months for a special Red Line episode. Brittany is currently running the organization Own Your Data, fighting for people's digital rights online, as well as trying to educate people on how to combat fake news in this new media landscape. She does some amazing work and I highly recommend you check out her Twitter on the handle at ownyourowndatanow. You can also purchase her book Targeted or watch her Netflix documentary The Great Hack for more information on Cambridge Analytica and how they influence democracies around the world. Michael Umbahawan is a great friend of the show and an incredible insight into large-scale US strategic problems. I've talked with Michael on a few occasions now and his insights on medium and long-term geopolitical problems are almost second to none. We hope to have Michael back again on the show soon for more of his great insights. If you want to follow Michael and his think tank, Akama, you can visit their website for more information. Once again, another thanks goes out to Mark Spencer for the additional vocals in the show that were not mine. Mark is one of the best guys in the game and is always working on a huge number of amazing projects. I highly recommend you check out his show, Climactic, and there's some big things in the horizon for that program. To finish up though, I want to say a thank you again for listening to the program. Your DMs, feedback, and listens are amazing to receive, and I can't thank you all enough. My Twitter is always open, and I welcome your feedback and questions. The Red Line will be back in a fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you, and good night.